Hey gang, I am Joe Edelman and welcome to The Last Frame Live. Tonight, straight up it's a Q&A, beginning to end. It's been a while since we did one. I'm not gonna lie to you, I'm in the middle of my prep for Imaging USA, which is this weekend. So I didn't have a lot of time this week to prepare something special. So I am hoping that I can help you solve some of your challenges in the next 60 minutes. And of course, as always, if you're watching the replay, chapters will be added in about an hour after the show. And for those of you that are watching live, you know the drill. Please leave me a little note in the chat. Let me know you're here and where you're watching from. And if you're watching the replay, no worries. Drop a comment below the video so that I know you're here already. We got a pretty good audience in here already. Phillip's here from uh, tomorrow in Australia. Uh, Chipuzo's here from Nigeria. I got Cooley here out in Indiana. Lynn's in New York. Uh, what we got? We got Eric in Mexico City. Keith in the south of France. Charlie in central North Carolina. Uh, we got, uh, let's see, who else here? Calvin in Maine. Uh, Way cool, gang. And Nassim, uh, hopefully he's back. He left a question earlier and I think he disappeared on me, but we'll see if he comes back so we can answer his question too. Um, all of you, thank you. You're part of a growing global community of photographers in over 100 countries around the world who tune in to watch The Last Frame every week. And for that, I'm gonna work really hard to help you with your photography tonight. And so that being said, Seriously, if you're here, hopefully there's some things you're working on. And it'd help me out if you let me know what it is and I will try and share some knowledge that can help you make it easier and make it better. And of course, as always, you know it would help a lot more people learn about the last frame. If you'd do me a solid, hit that thumbs up below the video. The more thumbs up, the more YouTube recommends the show to other people photographers. And of course, while you're down there, feel free to go ahead and hit that share button. Let your photography friends know that we are streaming live on YouTube right now. Twitter, Facebook, they're the fastest way to get the word out. Okay. So listen, I um, mentioned that I'm going to be headed out to Imaging USA. Uh, actually, I will be flying down to Nashville on Friday morning. All day Saturday, I'm gonna be teaching two, they're back to back, three hour hands-on workshops uh, where creativity and portraiture collide. And this is gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, this is literally a hands-on where the attendees, they're gonna be doing the work and creating with my guidance and my assistance. And by the way, number one, if you're going to Nashville for Imaging USA, there's still time to sign up for the pre-cons. They're on Saturday. Uh, number two, I'm not going to be there for the whole imaging this year, right? So if you want to see me, you either need to find me wandering around like Saturday evening after my pre-cons, if you're not in my pre-con, or come to my talk Sunday morning, 8 a.m. I know, 8 a.m. Why? I think PPA knows I'm a little hyper because every year that I do a platform talk for PPA, they schedule me for 8 a.m. on Sunday morning. But I'll tell you what, this will this will be worth it. This talk, I'm actually really excited about this talk. So if you're not coming to imaging, hopefully you'll get to see me do it somewhere else down the road if I ever get booked to do it again. But it is all about color. <coughs> Excuse me. And I've done some color talks before, but this one... This is way different. I really went at this one head on and I'm actually really stoked about this talk. A lot of great uh, information in it, a lot of great examples, uh, and the presentation, it's a 90 minute presentation, Sunday morning. It also includes a hands-on demo. I've got a gorgeous model that's gonna be there and we're gonna do some really crazy, fun color stuff. Um, also, for those of you trying to make money, and I know already I got a couple people with um, some business questions in here tonight. Next week, when I get back from imaging, in fact, it's Thursday night, um, I've got a class lined up, Smart Marketing for Photographers in 2023. And now this is a class that I'm putting on through my website, so you register on my website to attend. Uh, I will drop the link in the YouTube chat for you there, and it should also be uh, in the description below the video. Uh, really what this is, it's a little bit of foundational marketing stuff, which some of you may or may not already know, but we can always use refreshers. But it's geared towards foundational marketing as, 
as we sit here in 2021. In fact, or 2021, 2023. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about a couple marketing things tonight. Uh, because I've had a, a, in fact, part of what precipitated this topic tonight was a question that I've had asked to me several times in the last couple of weeks by photographers. And um, honestly, just the thought that people are, um, are considering doing this, it really, really kind of scares me. So uh, I'm going to talk some marketing tonight, not a lot, but uh, I would encourage you, if you're looking to make money in 2023 or if you've been making money but you're not making what you want to make, sign up for this course next Thursday night, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, U.S. You will find it very helpful. Also then, beginning of March, uh, March 6th, I will be in Las Vegas, WPPI. Uh, that runs from the 5th to the 9th. The trade show conference actually starts on the 6th and goes through the 9th at 6, uh, 6, 7, 8, 9, I think, something like that. Uh, but anyway, on Monday, the 6th of March, I will be doing a photo walk that people have been asking me to do for a long time, and it's called Posing Without Posing. So I am going to finally have the opportunity to take a group of people out. We'll be out and about around the Mirage Hotel, and I'll be able to show you my techniques for posing models, doing fashion shots, and even portrait stuff without actually giving the model a pose so that the pictures have more life to them, more energy, and the people don't look stiff and awkward. So I've got a special offer that I can share with you from the folks at WPPI. I'll drop the link in the chat. Um, if you use the WPPI BFF code that you see there in the middle of the page, you can uh, buy one, get one free on a full conference pass. So that's, that's the trade show plus all the education and then get $50 off a third pass uh, or just go ahead and use the code Edelman to receive a $40 discount off of the conference pass or just get a free trade show pass. So go ahead and um, get yourself signed up if you come to Vegas. I mean, come on, how much of an excuse do you need to come to Vegas, right? And let's be clear, these two shows, Imaging USA, WPPI, these are, these are the last of the big ones, right? Um, Photo Plus is kind of out there in limbo somewhere. We have no idea what's going to happen to that, if it's ever going to come back or, you know, if they'll get Create NYC off the ground that they tried to do last year. You know, a lot of smaller regional ones, but they're smaller and their trade shows are smaller. So if you want to be able to see gear from the manufacturers, these are the shows to do that in. Plus, uh, I will tell you both of these programs, Imaging and WPPI, they're the best educational programs you're going to you're going to find, period. And then one more to share with you, and this comes up um, the middle of April. It is April, I believe, tw something like 23rd to the 28th. I will be teaching this year at Texas School. I've heard about Texas School for years. I've never been invited until this year, and I'm really looking forward to it. What's cool about this is, number one, this is put on by TPPA. It's the Texas Professional Photographers Association. So that's the Texas regional branch of PPA. And this is a five-day event. It's Monday through Friday. You sign up for the class, and there's still space in my class. You will be working with me for five days, four and a half technically, right? So you don't switch instructors and all that kind of stuff. You come in and you learn from me solid for four and a half days. And it's going to be awesome because I'm going to be able to take people through my entire process and we will shoot. We will be shooting every single day. We will have models. We'll be shooting in studio settings. We'll be shooting on location. We'll be doing all of it. Lighting, posing, post-processing, retouching, all of it. And here's the crazy part. All five days, $750. That's insanely inexpensive. So check it out. I will share the link for Texas School. And when I get back from imaging next week, so on the next episode of The Last Frame, I will have some other exciting announcements coming up for events that are going to be happening later this year, okay? All right, so um, 
I teased the idea that I, I had a couple people ask me a question recently. Uh, it's a marketing question. So let me get that one out of the way. And by the way, I see some of you are, are loading some questions in here. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. You know, I'll, I'll do questions the full hour, gang. So this is great. The more questions, the better the show we're going to have and the more interesting it's going to be. Okay. Um, and remember also, too, when you ask me questions, the more detail you give me, the better, the more I'll be able to help you. Right. So the, the topic that, that this question has to do with, I mentioned, it's marketing, and it has to do with running ads. And basically, if I condense the question down, because I've heard several variations of it, and I've, even, I've seen a couple of articles recently, and that is, you know, should photographers, and we're talking specifically portrait photographers, wedding photographers, event photographers, et cetera, should you be buying ads? whether it's Facebook ads, whether it's Google AdSense ads, any of that stuff. Should you, or excuse me, AdWords, should you be buying ads to market your business? And every one of these people that asked me this question has already spent a, a rather sizable amount of money. And when I say rather sizable, I'm talking in excess of $1,000 on buying local ads for these purposes, you know, ads that are highly targeted on like Facebook or Instagram or um, local SEO type AdWords via Google. And not a one of them has gotten a return, a real return on their investment. And part of their frustration was everyone they've talked to has kind of dismissed them with the idea of, well, then you just didn't target your ads properly. And when I heard that, honestly, it makes my head want to explode. I know I use that phrase a lot, but, but it is, it, it's, it's such horrible advice. And the, the people that made that statement, like, oh, you're just not targeting the right words. Those people should never be given an opportunity to speak on anything, about anything, to anyone, because you could not be more clueless by saying something like that. You simply can't. And here's why. My straight up advice, I'll cut to the end first and then I'll give you the reasoning. If you're a photographer that's doing portraits, weddings, uh, events, any of that kind of stuff, do not, do not in any way, shape or form purchase traditional ads. Done. That's it. Now, I'm gonna give you a couple kind of caveats. I don't want to say exceptions because they're not real exceptions, but caveats to that, right? So understand, just like anything else in photography, there are always some exceptions. The some exceptions are always very particular and or specialized or uh, tightly attached to a specific location, right? So obviously, if you've got something and it's working super, super well, I know darn well you're also aware of the fact that it's because you've got a situation that most people don't. So good for you. But even with that, I'm going to challenge you. I've got a better way. So for those of you that are in business and have followed me when I talk about business, if you follow me for any period of time, I am a self-proclaimed marketing nerd. I've, I've always had... Um, kind of an interest in it. I find the psychology behind it fascinating that long before I even met my wife. And it's something that I really stay up to date on. But as you might imagine, just like with my photography, I am never one that looks at it from the standpoint of, well, everybody's doing this, so that's the right way to do it, and that's what I should do. Never. That's not a philosophy that I just apply to my photography. That's a philosophy that I apply to my entire business. It's the way I run my business. It's my marketing. It's everything, right? I'm not going to do it because everybody else does it. But here's what I will tell you. So you can call it a prediction. Uh, you can call it a trend. Right now, it's, it's, a, it's a beginning trend. I always talk about trends negatively. So should you jump on it? No, don't jump on the trend. 
but understand that the trend shows you there are other opportunities. So let me explain. Think about your own experiences online, on social media. What is really, really annoying, aside from obnoxious people that feel they have to have an opinion about everything, you know who I are if you're listening, what's annoying is advertising. We're all tired of seeing ads. We're tired of being sold. So if you happen to spend any time on TikTok, which I do, I will apologize for that. TikTok is freaking amazing. I love TikTok. So if you spend any time on TikTok, you'll notice there's a change. And look, love it or hate it, when it comes to social media, TikTok's where it's at. Now, I'm not saying that as photographers, you should be marketing there yet because you probably shouldn't be. But the fact of the matter is TikTok, TikTok is, is tuned in, their algorithms are tapping into what people like better than anybody else, better than Facebook, Instagram, all of them, right? There's tons of advertising on TikTok, tons, more than most people realize. And that's the beauty of it because it's not companies going in and doing slick ads. There's a little bit of that, but very little. Most of the advertising is, quote unquote, influencers doing what they do, creating the kind of content that they normally create, but including these companies and these products and mentions to them. And then, of course, links to them. Meaning, it goes back to something that I've talked about for years. It's advertising that provides value. What kind of value? I'm not talking discounts or sales. I'm talking entertainment. They're giving you the kind of entertainment that you go to TikTok to get, and they're making sure that they mention their product or show you their product, and of course, provide you a link to it. But they're not holding you hostage like you do when you watch a YouTube video where you've got to watch a 30 second ad or, or a minute worth of ads or anything like that. They're not holding you hostage. Right? With YouTube, you know, you watch a YouTube video, it's a trade. Okay, you're gonna watch a minute worth of ads and then you can see the video you want. How much of a pain in the ass is that? You know it is. Right? So, how does that translate to photographers? It translates to ask yourself the question. And this is the advice that I've been giving to all of you for years about marketing. You hear me talk about the idea, don't just post a picture up on social media. Just slap a picture up there. And I don't care if you're just posting to try and find other photographers and to maybe build a following, but especially if you're trying to build a business, don't just slap a picture up on Facebook and then wait for the likes to come in and wonder why nobody contacts you. And then don't double down on that mistake and post that picture and decide to type something like, uh, discounts on headshots. Or worse yet, don't do the post that says, why would you get a headshot from somebody for $50 because you need really professional headshots, yada, yada. Don't tell people what they should do. Why would you do that? The way you get, and look, if you went to a party, a social event, you wouldn't pull up a picture on your phone and you know walk around being and slam it in people's faces and then not say anything. People would think you're out of your freaking mind. So why do you do it on social media? Why? Tell stories. Your favorite pictures that you've ever taken, you love to tell a story about them. When people like your pictures, they tend to add, and I don't mean other photographers, I mean people, people who could be paying customers. They tend to ask you questions about how you made it or where you made it or what exactly is that? If you're really lucky, they'll make a comment. You must have a really nice camera, right? I'm kidding, but that happens. So the point is advertising for photographers is finally actually correcting itself. Now there's still plenty of lazy photographers out there that are throwing thousands of dollars at advertising 
and an attempt to break even on that spend, and, and it really doesn't work. Provide value. So if you're a portrait, a wedding, or an event photographer, that means your posts are gonna tell stories about the work you do, about the people that are in the pictures, the people that you photographed. Your, story, your posts are gonna include stories about um, how you go about doing your work, about why your work is important to you, about what's special about it. Your posts aren't gonna be, hire me, or even worse yet, I'm free Saturday afternoon, book me now. What do you think, people sit around waiting, oh, oh, finally, he's got a Saturday afternoon open, schedule something. No, they don't, okay? So, yes, if any of that connects to you or says, hey, uh, it sounds like I need to do more of that, but I'm not really sure where to start or how, you should sign up for that class next week, okay? All right, so uh, we got some good, keep the questions coming. I see some good ones in here, so I'm gonna work backwards. We got plenty of time, I'll, I'll get them all in, okay? Uh, from Calvin, do I print my own photos or do I send them out? <sighs> Calvin, I have to hang my head in shame. I hate when people ask me this question for a couple of reasons. Uh, the, the first and foremost is um, because of the answer that I have to give you, and that answer is that I send them out. I do not print my own work. Um, the reason why I don't print my own work is I do not, and this is the reason why I hang my head in shame, I do not print enough work. I am extremely guilty of that. I have talked about that before, so it's not like I've been hiding it, but um, yeah. As I get a little bit older, health permitting and everything else, and when I slow my career down a little bit, uh, that is one of my big priorities. In fact, actually over the last couple of months, I am a little bit at a time uh, paying to have a lot of my old transparencies uh, scanned. Last week I shared some, some old newspaper shots. I got a whole bunch more stuff coming, but I've been getting some of my old transparencies scanned and some of my old negatives scanned and um, trying to get as much of it digitized as possible. But yes, um, I don't know that I'll do a lot of um, big prints because I do have the downstairs of my house. Uh, I have huge 24 by 36 prints like throughout the entire downstairs. I did those when we moved into the house 11 years ago. Uh, and they're not my beauty portraits. They're, they're actually uh, very, very nice images from travels that my wife and I have done. So there's images from England and Germany and Italy and um, also from my son's wedding, which was on a beach uh, at sunset in um, Isla Mujeres, which is a little island about seven miles off the coast of Cancun, Mexico, that type of thing. So um, I, I do have images hang, but I, I do not print enough. And I'm not proud of that fact. Um, it's really my, my lame excuse is just not prioritizing it with everything else I have going on. Uh, but listen, there's no shame in outsourcing. Just in case that's why you're asking, um, printing yourself can actually be more expensive unless you do a fair amount of printing. Uh, simply because the ink goes bad and ink is not cheap. Understand, like the companies like Epson and Canon, and I'm not trying to make them out to be bad guys, but it is what it is. They don't make their money on their printers. They make their money on the ink. Because once you got the printer, you kind of got to buy the ink, right? And you got to buy their ink or you can buy, you know, some, some off brands, but the off brands have their own problems with them. So you're gonna spend a crap ton of money. That's the challenge, unless you're doing a lot of it. And then yes, you can get your costs down to a very manageable spot. Uh, Calvin, where do I send my stuff? I've used a couple labs on and off. Um, probably well, all the stuff that's in my house uh, downstairs, the stuff I was talking about was printed in, in Maryland at Nation's Photo Lab. Um, it's one of the smaller labs, not that they're tiny, but smaller compared to like White House, you know, Custom Color or uh, Bay Photo companies like that. Um, but I've used White House, uh, I've used MPix, I have used uh, Bay Photo. Um, you know, they, they all do great work. But all of my big prints that I have were done by Nations and they were awesome, very reasonably priced. Um, great job on the printing. So I was very happy with that.
Okay. Uh, Eric's question here. Have I ever explored or thought about exploring the NFT market um, idea or trend? Y yeah, thought about it, Eric. I paid attention to it when, you know, all the buzz happened. Where's all the buzz? I think it's the dumbest damn thing ever, right? The problem with so many of those, and I know people are just gonna say, oh, you know, he's an old fart, what does he know? Well, you know, look, hopefully I'll be around long enough for those people that say that to be able to laugh at me. But right now, I'm the one laughing. Anytime you get something new like that, there are gonna be people that jump in very, very early, and when the buzz hits, they're gonna make some real money. Good for them, right? Because they, they took the time, they took the risk. Risk both in terms of money and in terms of their time and effort to, to really learn it, to sort it out, to figure out what's going on, okay? So good for them. But what do you hear about NFTs in the photography world now? Who do you hear touting huge success stories? Right? It's crickets. It's crickets. To me, here's my opinion. What I just said so far is fact. My opinion, I don't think it makes sense. As a consumer, why would I buy something that I don't really, it's like the kind of money that people are, are, are were spending, okay? Why would I spend that kind of money on something that I don't own the copyright to? And, you know, think about it in, in terms of the art world and photography. And look, the world evolves. I'm all for evolution and change, but, but things evolve and change because they make sense, right? Um, NFTs, in theory, make a lot of sense for the creator because you can create something and then you can sell it and profit from it numerous times. And then if it gets resold, you also profit from it. All right, but here's the thing. Traditionally, what is one of the things that has made artwork and or photographs valuable? Limited access. Paintings, there's only one of them, right? Unless it's reproduced as a, a lithograph or whatever, but there's only one of the painting. Photographs, limited edition prints, like Ansel Adams, are worth much, much more than mass-produced prints, right? Uh, that makes sense, especially when it's numbered and you've got certification, et cetera. Um, Look, anytime something is touted as, oh, look, go get a piece of clip art and do this to it, and boom, you can make hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. You know that's not gonna last, and, and it's not lasting. You know, might the whole Bitcoin thing get sorted out, and might NFTs and, and fungible to non fungible tokens and all that be able to morph into something that is actually going to have value and be worthwhile? Maybe, but uh, yeah, I, I've never been one for the uh, get rich quick thing. And look, I'm, I'm the first to admit, as much as I have a very thorough knowledge of running a business and have run businesses successfully, I do find now I hate the money portion. I hate it with a passion. But you know, I'm also a person that throughout my career, I have routinely left money on the table, okay? And that's fine. I'm reaching retirement age. I'm gonna be able to retire comfortably. I've accomplished what I needed to accomplish. I've worked very hard to get there. But my priorities have never been with the money. Money's always been a necessity. So get rich quick stuff, not for me. Um, Let's see, testing, do you not use large soft boxes in your studio, and if so, is there a reason? Well, first of all, testing, it depends on what you want to deter, uh, refer to as large. Um, my my go-to box that, that is like my favorite box right now is a 32-inch Fodix Ronnie, okay? 32 or 33 inch, I'm not sure which it is, but um, so that's as big as I go most of the time. I have one five foot octa box, which I have not used in five years, like legit five years. I have not used it, not taken it out. Um, I don't need them. I find that most of the people that I talk to, and when I say most of the people I talk to, I'm talking beginners, people like people that are watching the show, people that are in my Todd knowledge community, they go out and they buy these massive boxes and they use them wrong, meaning they get really crappy light out of them because they see some idiot on YouTube use it and only half explain it 
and so they think it's the right thing to do because they chase a trend. And, and I can't stress this enough, gang. If you're buying a piece of equipment because of some bozo on YouTube, you deserve to throw your money away. That, by the way, that includes me. You've never heard me tell you, go buy this. All the years that I was an Olympus ambassador, you never heard me tell you to buy an Olympus camera, ever, not once. Those words never crossed my mouth. What you heard was me tell you what I liked about Olympus, which I did, and you saw me time and time and time again prove that I could do anything with a micro four thirds camera that anybody else could do with a full frame camera. That's why Olympus made me an ambassador. But I refused to be a salesperson, and that's also why I dropped all my sponsors. I dropped all my sponsors at the beginning of the year. I'm not sponsored by anybody. There's a couple companies that are hiring me every now and then to go teach in an event. I'm going to be doing an event later this year for uh, Tamron, right? But that's an event. I don't have to pitch their stuff. I'm going to teach, and it's sponsored by for that talk. But I am not an ambassador, and, and I'm not interested in becoming an ambassador. Um, the, the problem with influence, all of you need to understand, and this is part of why I stepped away, because I realized that what was happening is if, you know, I had gadget B and I mentioned it, thousands of people were running out and buying it just because I mentioned it. And look, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be modest, I'm being really honest. To me, that's a scary thing. I'm like, why the hell would people do that? I would never do that. I've never watched a YouTube video and said, oh my God, look at that, I gotta go buy it. I've watched YouTube videos and said, ooh, that looks interesting. Let me learn more. And then I've gone and researched it. And usually have made it a point to try and get my hands on one to um, basically, you know, get a sense of what can I do with this? Is it worth the money, et cetera? Is the, is the build quality there? All those things. Um, so, so that's kind of the problem with the big boxes. M most photographers don't need big boxes testing. Um, in my studio, so there's two reasons. Reason one, you just got it. I don't need them for the kind of work that I shoot. Look, look at my images. Why would I use a big box? I mean, please, that's, that's the first thing, right? You're asking me, how come you don't use big boxes? Have you, have you ever looked at my pictures? What would be the benefit of using a big box? Maybe that's the question you should be asking. Because if you don't know, if you can't look at my pictures and understand why I don't use a big box, then you shouldn't be buying big boxes. Like seriously, I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm keeping it level here, right? Because you can look at the pictures and you can see right away why. That is, you can see right away if you, if you understand lighting. And when I say understand lighting, I mean if you understand the inverse square law. If you've got enough experience to look at an image. Because here's the thing, and there's, there's probably some people here from my talk knowledge community, so I'm gonna brag a little bit, but I've got witnesses. I do this all the time. When I review images or help people problem solve in my talk knowledge community, people will share a screen on Zoom and put a picture up, and I can look at that picture and I can tell them how big the modifier was, where they placed it, and how far it was from the subject. 90% of the time, I'm spot on. People think it's you know kind of like some circus trick type thing, but no, it's just years and years and years and years of experience, right? So I'm not saying you need to be quite that good, but if, it, but if you can't look at the pictures and figure out why I wouldn't use a big box, then you probably shouldn't be buying a big box. But the other reason that I don't use big boxes that often, five years, is my studio has a seven and a half foot ceiling. So when I use a big box, I can't lift to that box very high. That in and of itself, if photographing people, creates a problem. And if you don't understand what that problem is, that's actually really simple lighting physics, then you probably shouldn't be buying a big box. I'm serious, right? And so that would be another question for you to ask, okay? All right, scrolling on back here. And Beverly, I, I see your question. I promise I'm gonna come back. I promise I'll come back to the end, but I, I said I'd work these backwards first. So um, from Dan, I'd like to offer free high school portraits to those that cannot afford a photographer. Damn, good for you, man. Um, I hated my small black and white shot. Is that good for notoriety or being too cheap? 
Ah, well, so here's the thing, Dan. Um, number one, don't do it for notoriety, period. Uh, you, you just shouldn't. I, I'm a big believer in kind of that human value of like, look, if you're gonna do something to help people, uh, that's cool, but, but don't, don't try to parlay that, right? Um, now, that being said, would it be bad if you got some notoriety from it? Of course not. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm admittedly, I'm, I'm going to walk the line, right? But um, I, I wouldn't do it with the idea that, hey, I, I want to, um, let's say, call the local newspaper or call a local television station and get them to come out and cover the fact that I'm doing it. Kind of like a certain really well-known headshot photographer did early on in the pandemic or roundabout then, you know. Um, I guess it wasn't pandemic. It had, probably had nothing to do with the pandemic. But yeah, I, I'm not a big fan of doing that, right? Um, I am a big fan of doing it, doing it well. And basically the gamble that you're taking is that some word of mouth will come back and goodwill. You know, it's kind of a karma thing, right? Um, so the being too cheap part, uh, it's not being too cheap if you're doing it for free because there's no cheap involved. The challenge in what you're talking about is defining the criteria of cannot afford a photographer. That's the challenge, right? Now, depending on the area of the country that you're in and the economic standards you know, in that area, it might be very easy to determine that. Other places might be a little bit of a slippery slope, right? So that's really kind of the thing that you're going to have to look at is, you know, how am I, how am I determining that? Like, what's the cutoff, so to speak? Because it's not like you can ask people for their tax returns for proof. That's going to be a bit much, right? Um, but no, I, I don't think that's, I don't think it's bad at all. Um, use it for goodwill and, you know, by all means, feel free to say to those people, hey, you know, uh, if you like your stuff, you know, Please don't hesitate to mention to people that you loved your pictures done by me. Uh, it is reasonable to ask people that you do that for. Um, you could go to the extent in today's world, you could go to the extent of having them sign an NDA or better yet, just ask them. It's like, hey, listen, I'm doing this favor and I'm really glad that you, you know, enjoyed the photographs, but please do not discuss what it cost you with anybody. And so that's a kind of situation where you're just trying to build goodwill that they'll talk about your work and show off your work, right? Um, so you just, you got to think it through about what's going to work best for your area and best for your business. But if you think about it, people that are financially um, stressed, it's a really tough position to put them in to say, well, let me market based on your you know, shortcomings or, or, or your bad luck, right? So that's, that's the thing that you got to kind of be careful of there, okay? JDS, see you on Saturday at 2 p.m. for your class. Awesome. Hey, oh, greetings from Baltimore. Cool. JDS, are you, are you driving to Nashville or are you flying to Nashville? Let me know. Um, any camera works? Jane from Alaska, greeting. I've been practicing photography every day for a week for at least 20 minutes a day, so I hope to keep it up. I won't beat myself up if I can't do it daily. Yeah, oh, hey, look, you never beat yourself up if you can't do it. But yeah, you do. You hold yourself accountable to what are your goals. So good for you, okay? Absolutely good for you. Make sure you give yourself, give yourself some flexibility, right? Um, there is going to come a time, sooner than later, where some of the things that you're going to want to learn or practice, you're not going to be able to do them in 20 minutes, right? You're going to need 60 minutes or maybe 120 minutes. So make sure you're giving yourself some flexibility and definitely don't beat yourself up if you don't get to it every day. And remember, just like I talk about the things that I do when I walk my dogs, right? Looking at lighting and looking at textures and looking at composition. I'm not taking pictures. It's the same damn neighborhood. I've walked the dogs around twice a day for 10 years, right? I have no desire to take pictures, but that doesn't mean that I can't use my photography brain to keep things sharp and to keep seeing things, right? So, so even on the days where you can't necessarily actually practice or actually pick up a camera, still a lot of things that you can do that are gonna, gonna benefit you, right? So that's awesome. 
Hector, I have a photo shoot this weekend using two flashes with uh, gels, red and blue. Should I use lower power and flashes closer or higher power and the flashes away to get the most color saturation? Uh, take your pick, Hector. The question that you're asking doesn't impact color saturation at, at all. It, it doesn't matter. Lower power closer, higher power further away, it is going to have zero, zero difference on, on the saturation. What's going to impact the saturation is one, how saturated are your filters? Two, where do you put the color? Are you creating shadow areas? Are you blending the colors? Right? So let's say I'm going to do a portrait just with one color. So my key light, well, here, we'll do it this way. My key light's over here like it is right now in my studio. But if I, I don't have a color light here, do it. No, I don't. If I had a color light on this side, right, see all the shadow? If I put a, a red gel here, I would get red in that shadow, and it would be nice, saturated red. What you're talking about doing, do I put it closer or further away, that's going to impact how much of a dividing line. So let's just say you had blue on one side, red on the other, right? Simple, it's probably not what you're gonna do, but let's just use that as an example. So, you know, if you have them back a little bit, you're gonna get a dividing line down the middle, right? The closer the lights are, the more that dividing line will be a hard light because the light falls off rapidly. It's this thing called the inverse square law that I talk about all the time, and I have a video about it, so go check it. Right? The further you move them back, the light falls off more subtle. So you're going to have a point where you're going to have blue, red, and purple in the middle because the blue and the red are going to blend and you'll get purple. So the saturation piece has nothing to do with the example that you gave me. The example that you did give me is going to determine um, what happens with the inverse square law and depending on where your lights are placed, will you actually get blending from them, okay? Uh, Cooley, I saw this earlier, and this is really cool. Trying to, uh, trying to start up a project, doing portraits of vets of all wars, one page where the favorite, uh, their favorite quote is, on the other page with a portrait, and then design a book using Lightroom and sell it as a fundraiser for homeless vets. Cooley, I think that's awesome. In fact, you know, it's interesting. I, after you typed that earlier, since it was right before I started, I had seen this article on Petapixel and I went and grabbed it. There's a lot of these portrait projects that people have done. And I really like what you're doing with their quote and, you know, a portrait of them. But here's one that I've never seen done before. Uh, and I think this is not only brilliant, but I think this photographer did a brilliant job of it, okay? This guy took a portrait of 100 people. So he, he did 100 portraits aged one to 100, so one person who's one year old, one person who's two year old, one person who's 20 years old, one person who's 25, and so on. It's absolutely brilliant, and you know what? They are all environmental portraits. They're all in black and white, and I think it's just absolutely awesome. And it, the photographs are interesting. Um, he worked very, very hard, and they're all from a small town, by the way. So this is, this is 100 people all from a fairly small town, I think it's in, yeah, Slovakia, okay? Like, wow. Um, but all the people also have interesting stories behind them. So, I, you know, I think this, that's brilliant. I, I think, you know, the, the key, and Cooley, I'll tell you where I've seen, I've seen these kind of projects fail because a photographer gets a really great idea and then focuses on the quantity. Let me get as many people like this guy that I just showed you. Let me get 100 people, right? And the photography suffers. So since you're working with vets, the first and most important thing is remember that, number one, these are people that we should revere. Uh, I didn't serve in the military. My father was in the Air Force during the Korean conflict, but... He had a desk job in London, so it's not like he saw, you know, any, any, uh, any battle time. But I have um, cousins who spent their lives in the military, an uncle in the military. I have tremendous respect for people that have served, and we all should. Whether we agree with war or not, we should 
have tremendous respect for our veterans because they all made a sacrifice, good, bad, or otherwise. Um, your challenge with a project like that is to make sure that your photography raises to the level that shows that respect, tells a little bit of their story. Even if, even if you're gonna work on like a solid color background, then the story is their face. The story is their expressions. The story is their body language, right? But you need to work really, really well to tell the story and to make the images truly interesting. Because here's the thing, even if people who see your book respect veterans, hopefully they do, the experience that those people won't have is the experience you're gonna have. Let's say you, you photograph 50 veterans. You get to meet with and talk to all 50 of those veterans. You get to learn their stories. You get to experience them. The people that see your pictures in your book, they don't. They get to experience your photos. So your photos have to share that story. And your photos have to make these people as interesting to somebody who didn't meet the, the vet as they were to you. So I will sincerely look forward to seeing it. I, I think that kind of stuff is really, really cool. Uh, the key is remember, quality, not quantity, right? So don't rush it. Um, Danny Vasquez, all the way back to the beginning here. Would you have considered working for Time Magazine when they were in publication? Uh, sure, but I, I don't think Time would have uh, necessarily, you know, been hiring me. Um, my newspaper career, so look, I, you know, I, I've told you guys before, I, I, I don't brag about it, it's not to brag about, but I'm honest about it. You know, I, when I was younger, uh, much younger, my son was two years old. I left the newspaper business and, uh, or no, excuse me, my son was four years old. I left the newspaper business and started a portrait and wedding photography business with no clue what I was doing and failed. A couple months later, almost had a car repossessed uh, through the graciousness of the loan officer at the bank where I took out the loan. Um, this man over the course of the next year and a half taught me how to run a business. Uh, he didn't have to do that, but he did. And changed my life. I wound up with a very successful you know, business. Uh, my newspaper career, actually most of it happened in my teen years, uh, late teens, and in my early 20s. And so my problem was, as far as like working for somebody like Time, number one, I didn't stay in the industry long enough. Number two, I did not go to college. So true story here. You guys all like it when I tell stories. I'll, I'll tell you this story. Uh, this was a painful one, but it was the right outcome. When I was 20 years old, I had the opportunity and I met with the chief photographer of the Philadelphia Inquirer. So remember, I, I grew up and I lived in a small suburb about 30 miles outside of Center City, Philadelphia. So the big paper, there were three of them actually in Philadelphia. There was the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Philadelphia Bulletin, and the Philadelphia Journal for a, a stretch of time in there, okay? And also the Daily News, which is still around. Uh, the Daily News was uh, part of the Inquirer. Right? So uh, I met this guy who was the chief photographer and had an opportunity to show him my work and he really liked my work. So this was like amazing. So he arranged for me to have an interview with the photography editor at the Inquirer. And at the time the Inquirer was, was one of the premier papers in the United States. Like that's a big deal. They had, I believe about 17 staff photographers at the time. I may be off by a couple, um, but they were in that ballpark. So um, I went to meet with this gentleman and he looked through my portfolio, looked at my resume and sat for a couple minutes like silent. It's like the long, it's, it might've only been like 30 seconds, but it felt like 10 minutes. And I'm sitting there and, and you know, I'm in, um, I'm in this big conference room at, at the Philadelphia Inquirer, and he looks up at me and he's like, I really like your work, but I have a big problem with you. <laughs> at which point I'm like, and that's exactly how he said it, I have a big problem with you. 
And I'm like, uh-oh. You know, and he's like, you don't have a college degree. And I don't have a photographer without a college degree. And so he sits there again and he's quiet because, you know, I don't, I, what do you say to that? I didn't have a college degree. So um, he sits there thinking for a minute and he says, I'll tell you what, I've got an idea. This may not be fair. And he says, for all I know, it's illegal. But if you want to work here, you're going to go ahead and do it. <laughs> okay. And he says, we have a test that we sometimes give to writers uh, and even some of our photographers have taken this test. And he says, it's like an SAT test. He says, I want you to take the test. If you can score better than 70%, we'll talk about having you come to work at the Inquirer. And he told me they had an opening. They had lost a photographer. They were down one shooter. They had an opening. Um, he really liked my feature work. Um, Already the big city papers were starting to get away from spot news, I, the kind of spot news that I was covering in small towns, like car accidents and that kind of stuff. So uh, he was very interested in the way I approach my feature work. And, and so I was like, okay, cool. So I go home, they, their, their HR department called and scheduled this test and I went and um, this was a four hour test. And they literally sat me in this little room all by myself. It was like literally like, you know, I was doing an SAT and as well as ones, you know, you fill in the circles, okay? And I did this test. And I walked out of that room thinking, wow, like, I kind of feel like I did okay, but I had no freaking idea. I mean, fortunately, it's not that I was a bad student. I just chose not, 1978, 77, 78, that was kind of the tipping point. It wasn't an automatic thing people went to college. And, and I graduated high school and I had a full-time job as a newspaper photographer, so I didn't go to college. Um, so two weeks go by, and I'm dying. I haven't heard from the guy. So finally, I get up the nerve. It's like, all right, time to call him back. So I call him back, and he's like, yeah. He's like, I'm surprised he didn't call me sooner, but it's OK. He's like, I've honestly been kind of dreading your phone call. And I'm like, whoa, that's not good. I'm thinking, great, I blew the test, and he just didn't want to tell me. He's like, listen, I'm going to tell you straight up. You aced that test. You had like a 96% on that test, so good for you. So the problem is, two days after you were here, there was a woman who had been a photographer at the Inquirer, very good, won a ton of awards. She had left the Inquirer and gone, I believe, out to the West Coast, I think it was San Diego, and hated it. And just happened to call him up out of the blue and said, hey, if any openings come up, I'd love to come back. So he had the choice between this 20-year-old punk with no college degree, but aced the test, or a woman who had already won awards at the Inquirer, who was very good, had experience working at the Inquirer in the city of Philadelphia. She got the job. Uh, and he made the right choice. I, I can't blame him for that. I mean, I was seriously bummed because I was, you know, that close. But he made the right choice. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I don't know that at the time that I was doing a lot, I would have had the opportunity. But certainly if I'd have had the opportunity, <laughs> hell yeah. Like... Who would turn down Time Magazine, right? Um, so scrolling back on up here, uh, Beverly, how many lights do you like to use to do a headshot? I know it depends on the customer needs. So actually, it doesn't depend on the customer needs so much, but th that's going to have an impact on it for sure. Um, generally, if it's just kind of like a straight up headshot or a simple portrait, shall we say, I'm going to go with three lights. It's, you know, like a three point light setup uh, or a variation of that. Uh, a key light, a rim light, and a background light is, is usually where I'm going to be. And potentially adding a reflector in for kind of a faux fill light. In other words, not a full blown fill with a catch light, but um, just a little bit of a soft shadow fill. So it's usually going to be going to be three. Okay. Um, Alvaro, do you think it's changing what people understand as a good photo? And if that change existed, what would, you, what would be the most logical thing to do? Oh, I absolutely think it, it's changing in terms of what people think is a good photo, in part because people, both photographers and non-photographers, get caught up in trends, right? But here's the thing. Um, we could also argue, let me flip the script now, we could argue that it's never changed. So that's just two different answers I gave you, right? So 
Let me explain. We could argue that it's changed in the sense that, think about Instagram feeds two or three years ago where like, you know, all the influencers and even photographers, like their entire Instagram feed would be like toned a, a brownish color or a, a blue and teal color, right? And so like all their images had this, you know, kind of tone to it, right? Those people were getting rewarded, big views, lots of likes, all that kind of stuff, right? So, you know, there's this kind of change, there's this trend that people are chasing. Uh, but here's the thing, that the example I always like to give to people that says a good photograph hasn't changed at all ever would be go to Google. You've heard me use this analogy before. Go to Google and type in the phrase, don't do it right now, but when we're done. Type in the phrase iconic photographs and click on the images tab. And look through the pictures. You'll see images that are five years old. You'll see images that are 100 years old. You'll see a lot of images that break the rules. They don't actually break the rules. They, they're actually, they technically, as far as the rules go, a lot of these images suck. Some of them are out of focus. Some of them are horribly exposed or way too contrasty. Yada, yada, yada. Lots of them, there's no rule of thirds, none of that stuff. You can't put, you can't put a Fibonacci spiral on it, none of that stuff. But yet these pictures are considered iconic photographs. They've stood the test of time. How? because of the emotion and the moment that they represent. Those two words, emotion and the moment. So in that regard, Albert, I don't think that what is seen as a good photo has changed at all, right? Because even when people are doing selfies, you know, Instagram influencers are doing selfies and that, they're creating moments. They're having fun, right? They're recording these things that they're doing. So, um, yeah, will we have judges that want to, you know, say a picture should look like this? Uh, sure. Like, you know, look, I love PPA. You all know that. I make money by teaching for PPA. But I got to be honest, like when I look at a lot of the images that are winning the competitions nationally for PPA, you know, they're really big on like these, this painted look. They don't look like photographs. They look like digital artwork. And look, I love digital artwork, but, but that's not a photograph, right? It's based on a photograph. It's a heavily manipulated photograph. So I don't know that I like seeing that as the stuff that wins the top prizes consistently from a photography organization. Maybe that's me just being an old guy, right? But indeed, it changes. Um, the most logical thing to do, Alvaro, is to do you. Uh, literally, do you. Come on, that's what you see me do, guys. Do you. Don't worry about doing what everybody else does. Will some people come to you and say, hey, can you do this? And you're going to have to say, no, I'm sorry, I don't do that. And you're not going to get that customer. That's OK. You can't get every customer. If you got every customer, you wouldn't have enough hours in a day. You don't want every customer. You want the right customers that see the value in what you do and what you create, who are willing to pay you well for what you do. That's what you want. That's what I want. That's what everybody wants, right? So you don't have to change anything about what you do. Daniel, creative enterprises are very hard to monetize as it is a uh, parallel distribution. Its primary purpose is to entertain and not to make money. You must enjoy the endeavor for the sake of the enjoyment. Creative enterprises. I'm not sure what that's in response to, and I'm assuming, Daniel, it has to do with something that I said, and I am apologizing because I, I don't quite... Um, I don't quite recall the, the correlation. Uh, that's, that statement as it stands, I would actually disagree with part of it because there's a lot of creative enterprises that are making a crap ton of money, especially in the social media world today. Uh, it's actually very easy to monetize creativity. But the key word in that sentence is creativity, not monetize. Truly creative. There's a lot of shit out there that's not creative and those people aren't making money. But then the flip side, there's a lot of stuff that's insanely creative, and those people are making bank. So, yeah, I, I apologize. I'm, I'm not sure exactly which statement you were responding to there. Testing, I wouldn't say the work you display requires a, lot of soft, a large softbox, but I know you shoot personal photography too, is why I asked. Uh, yeah, no, I don't work that hard, man. I never have. So, you know, what you see me do with my crazy stuff is actually the same way I shoot a headshot or a simple portrait just not with all the crazy stuff, right? My lighting is not that ridiculous. It's really pretty simple. And look, every now and then I go off the deep end, but go back and look at all the lighting diagrams that I've shared over the years and stuff like that. 
it's it's not that crazy. It's nothing that's, you know, way outside the box. It's not. Remember, I, you know, started out with newspaper photographer, et cetera. I've always focused on what's in front of the camera. I still do today. My A number one priority is what's in front of the camera. And then all the technology involving the camera, you know, the physics stuff, inverse square law exposure, all that, that's got to be done right. But beyond that, uh, I tend to keep lighting fairly simple. That, I, if I had to say, like, what's, what's great about my lighting, I would have to say it's the simplicity of my lighting in most cases. Every now and then, yes, I go crazy. So, um, Charlie, data rate interruptions, man, that's up to you. Sorry, not me. I got a good data stream here, okay? Um, I always love it when people tell me, yeah, my data sucks. I pay more money for your data, Charlie. Sorry. Um, I'm going out on gigabit Fios here, man. I got plenty of bandwidth going out, and it's showing me the rate monitor on the way here. So, uh, Dan, thank you for your insight. I was actually, uh, you actually answered more than I was thinking. I'm going to go forward uh, with this through my church. Good for you. Eric, uh, thanks for saying the thing about painted photographs. I was about to go crazy thinking I'm the only one noticing that these are not even photographs anymore. Yeah, and you know what? Eric, the thing of it is, is they're, they're really cool. They are, sincerely. But I, I don't know. I just feel that they should be kind of, in, and in some cases they are, let's be clear. They're like in a digital category or a digital art category. Um, but what I'm seeing is because they've won a lot of awards, there's a trend where a lot of people are moving in that direction. And I just, I kind of don't buy into that. It's not my thing. I like it. I think it's neat, but in kind of a novelty way, right? Uh, definitely wouldn't be something that I would, and look, I do a lot of compositing, so that's why I, I, I can't trash that stuff too much, but it's just, it's not my thing. And I do, I see a lot of people chasing it. It is like a trend now. And as you guys have heard me say before, anytime there's a trend happening, you can bet money I'm gonna be sitting over here. And my stuff won't necessarily be anywhere near as good as what's in that trend. Never said it is, but it'll be my stuff. And, and that's, that's what motivates me. So, all right gang, hey, you guys were great tonight. We had a really good kind of range of questions. Absolutely awesome, thank you, good discussion. Um, again, for those of you that are gonna be in Nashville, JDS, I know you said you're gonna be there in my afternoon class on Saturday. Looking forward to meeting you. I will see those of you that will make it to Nashville. All the rest of you, I'll see you back here uh, next Wednesday. If you're in my Tog Knowledge community, tomorrow night we will have our community meetup. Uh, so that'll happen uh, normal place, normal time. But beyond that gang, you know the drill. You got less time ahead of you now than you did yesterday. Don't waste it. Go pick up that camera and shoot something. Because your best shot, it's your next shot. Adios, gang.